take a look at the NRC. That's supposed to work for you and me. But they promote atomic industry. We get radiated. And when you get radiated, they're gonna just fall down and die. But the tower nation builds up in your body. And radiation shortens your life. Well, take a look at where your money goes. They built a worldwide nuclear show. We gotta get up and tell them no. We don't wanna be radiated. Now put your left foot in, you put your right foot in. Say goodbye to your feet. Pass the poison, all the air you breathe, and all the food you eat. Look at the Pentagon, what do you see? Those boys are playing in World War III. They're playing games with humanity. The we get radiated. Well, we gotta get together and stop those Pentagon plans. Cause there won't be no future if we we'll leave it in the military's hands. Take a look at where you're playing. leaked out at Harrisburg. For the first three hours, they tried to contain the news of the meltdown at TMI. They tried to put a blanket on all the media. We don't know how many accidents happened up there that we weren't told. Med Ed's not the one that told us. There was a, pe a person on a two-way radio that, that got word of what was going on inside the building, and he's the one that left it out then to civil defense. At TMI, it leaked out. The workers were talking about it. Civil defense monitors were going up. If there was no way they could have hid the news of the meltdown at TMI. Uh, they had film clips of the helicopter with the monitors approaching TMI. And before it got over the smokestacks, you could see the Geiger counters just redlined, you know, while they were over it and as they went past it. And nobody in the cockpit said a word about what the Geiger counter was doing. They had the sound on and everything. But you could sit there and watch the needle just redline itself. And I saw that, and I, then I called my mom and dad, then told them to get the hell out. I said, those folks aren't telling you everything. And they brought on the news that there was a crack in Unit 1 reactor, and the goosebumps just went up and down my arm because this has been a nightmare, the whole thing to us, and uh, it has really changed our lives. And I guess it has really touched us the whole way through, I guess you'd say. Oh, yes, there were some of them uh, deathly afraid of the situation. It's like electricity, you know, people don't stick their finger in the socket because they can't see the volts. And uh, that's the same type. The only thing is this gives off more deadly stuff, you know, that you cannot see and it gives it off such as iodine in the air and, uh, you know. The information that we were getting uh, here in the immediate area uh, was so um, scratchy until we did not know just how serious this whole thing was that we were sitting on a powder keg here and at any time that uh, we could have been in a very uh, serious uh, danger. A tw 25 micro count is normal background radiation. We got 350 count within the school and then we got something like 25,000 outside of the school. We put, well, we opened the window, which we were not supposed to do, put the counter out and it sounded like a machine gun. It was just, the, instead of the normal little click, click, click that you get, it was just um, a barrage, just a continual sound. No, I had 16 uh, goats ready to deliver and uh, I couldn't go anywhere unless I took them with me. So I had to stay right here and I was outside working in the barn and on the land. So whatever we got from that, why, I got it. I just left because I was scared. I didn't know anything about strontium-90 or plutonium or uranium or, or anything at all. We moved our kids out of the area, which some of the children didn't. But to tell us it's not safe for a preschool child to be in the area, well, how do I know it's safe for my eight-year-old son to be in the area if it's not safe for a five- or six-year-old son?
Then when I got out to the van, um, then I really knew what happened because my mom and dad were there and we had everything packed in the van ready to get go down to my um, grandma's. And well, then I was, then I got really scared. If I would hear the fire sirens going, that's it. That's a scary time too, because like he right about a couple days after the. Um, time when we get home, when we sit here, the fire sirens, we always get scared, but, well, that ain't really happening anymore, because, well, we feel okay now, but, um, well, still, I wish I w wouldn't have happened. It was weird, because all I wanted was to get my husband and my daughter and leave. Do you know what I mean? I had, I went through the totally unlogical feeling of wanting to open up a back door and take off on foot. It was, it was like I had to sit there and hold myself from just bolting, totally irrational bolting. It was really awful. It, um, for me, it was like being in a dream when I don't know if you've ever had a dream like this when you can't get your feet moving fast enough, like they're either stuck in tar or in sand or um, in something where you you're just can't move fast enough. And I felt that uh, I could have carried the car quicker than I could drive it. And I went to the schools and got each one of the children and just in a very controlled state, just drove right out of here. Yeah. Our cattle, we saw. A lot of cattle. We lost a total of 21 cows and calves that we saw die here in this farm. Sure, that hurts. That hurts deeply. Our first calf was stillborn, and then the cows would live for about a week after that, and then they'd die. I was involved in uh, one of the incidences where uh, one farmer had a number of uh, stillbirths and uh, uh, cows dying after birth. We had our first calf that was stillborn. And the cow lived for about somewhere around six or seven days after that. And then the cow died. Um, we had seven cows that had calves stillborn. And then the cows died a week after that. We've had red blotches on our arms over that period. We had, we had blotches that big red, that bright red in our arms. We took baths, and the next day or two, it was gone. But that, that was definitely radiation exposure. But sure doesn't make you feel good to realize that me and my wife and family have been exposed to it. It sure doesn't <laughs> make you sleep good at night, put it that way. There's 17, pe 17 farmers that we're in contact with that have lost cattle and had uh, cattle-related deaths and things like that in the area. And to date, we have a severe deficiency, which is shown as severe arthritis, blindness, multiple fractures of bones all over the body, especially the rib bones and the long bones of the animals. And this fracture area were of multiple nature. The uh, state veterinarian's office uh, had uh, looked into that, and as I understand it, uh, these were found to be a result of virus. Uh, and not radiation induced. Uh, radiation takes a long time to uh, produce any health effects anyway. It doesn't happen right after. And this indicates that there was some type of a imbalance or some type of a deficiency that would cause this. We don't have this condition in other areas. It's only in this small area around this particular neighborhood. When the wind is coming this way, it's always on cloudy weather. And the vapors from the plants do not rise very high in the air. Therefore, they're not dispersed over a large area. A lot of the trees around here are burnt. They look like they're burnt. I don't know what's wrong with them. Turn around and look. I wondered why the abnormally of the color of the leaves there. I noticed the birds uh, right after uh, TMI accident. They uh, were picked up, uh, were just laying dead. 
there's about seven farms on this side of the river that are having trouble. And they're with us, but they won't tell the public about it because they're scared of that they'll get cut off by the milk company and things. My milk market is at stake because I spoke up. Due to the reason that I did speak up, the, uh, the publicity, what it's going to do, the milk market and things like that, I can see that point. But if I keep quiet and they fire this thing up, and it does something a whole lot worse. Won't I feel guilty, feeling like I should have spoke up more than what I did? If I see people killed, that may be prevented by somebody speaking up and trying to tell the truth. We never had this trouble with them before we had the, the power plant over here. Because my daddy moved here in this place in 1914. Right after the accident, I had... Uh, Four baby lambs born. Uh, they looked perfectly normal. They only lived a few hours. And um, I had uh, a pregnant goat die full of four. There was four babies in her. We had her autopsied. And um, I had two other baby goats die. And rabbits, which I have always been able to raise, uh, four litters in a row were all born dead and deformed right after that. Those few days we spent at the house, right across the Three Mile, we did get sore throats, which it does affect your um, thyroid glands in your, your throat. And everybody around the area had, had the sore throat. And doctors wouldn't believe you. They say it's your imagination. People, the, their senses are extremely heightened as a result of this. Uh, people can smell, see, and believe they're seeing things that aren't there. Literally hundreds of people in the Harrisburg area have experienced the classic symptoms of radiation sickness over the past several months. Now, I might be somewhat skeptical of this, uh, given my, my own personal background and biases, if I had not been one of those. Well, the wind was coming from over there, and I was hanging my wash up, and my eyes really burnt, water was running out of them, and I was rubbing them. I had bloodshot eyes till I had my wash hung up. Uh, many, many people have reported sore throats, nausea, diarrhea, skin rashes, burning eyes, the so-called metallic taste and metallic odor. Um, I've also had, I mean, I was down around the plant also, and uh, on certain days you could taste the metallic taste in your mouth. The next morning you could taste it in your mouth. Left Friday, and we came, um, my parents came back Saturday, and I came along to help do the work. And um, during that day, I got sick on my stomach, and my lips tasted funny. Like, they said the iodine makes your lips taste bitter-like. And so I went in and laid down for a while, and then we went down to a restaurant near here to get some um, food, and um, it tasted awful bitter. Nothing tasted right. So um, they, tell, they told us that if you taste it down your lips, and if you were sick, I was nauseous and things. If you were like that for more than, you said an hour or so, that you had too much of the radiation. And I had it for about eight hours. That don't sound too good. And people say no one died as a result of the accident. That's absolute medical ignorance to say that because no one just drops dead from radiation. It takes a long time for the cancers to develop. They just told us there ain't nothing they can do about it. The instant that you're irradiated, the chain of events in some cell, and you set in motion irreversibly on the path to cancer. And that means that the injury is immediate, not later. You now have the formation of cancer. Radiation is going to continue to be released in Harrisburg for the next two years as that accident is cleaned up. Um, it's a guinea pig population. The incidence of malignancy is obviously going to rise and genetic disease. It's going to take 20, 30, 40, 50 years to discover what that means. Of course, we're not all dropping dead right now. But in 20 years, come back. We're going to be some of the loudest sick people anybody has ever seen. Do you have a thought about why they do body scans? Well, they're looking for, for radioactive uh, materials in their bodies. The trouble is that plutonium doesn't emit gamma radiation and the body scanners only measure gamma, which is coming out of the body. Alpha radiation only travels a distance of a couple of cells in the body and beta radiation a little further, but it doesn't get out the body. One good way to allay the public suspicions would be to have them do a whole body scan because nothing is going to show up anyhow. 
So they were just testing to see if people had stuff inside them. And I know one woman said to me that she had radiation in her body, but they said it was because she lived in a stone house, just because the house just happened to be next to Harrisburg reactor didn't seem to bother them at all. This is precisely the kind of thing they told to the people around the area of fallout in Utah. That when there were high levels registered, they said, oh, well, your drinking water has got a lot of natural radium in it. There is no such thing as cesium-137 and strontium-90 in the natural environment. Some of, our, some of the children that, uh, from my practice were tested for radiation. They had body scans and uh, it was found that there were increased levels of radiation in their bodies. Uh, so what are we supposed to tell these families? Uh, that there is indeed increased level of radiation, we don't know what's going to happen, and they are just part of the experiment. But, uh, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission released the, uh, the body scans and gave them to the family, and they told them, this is it, this is the background radiation, and uh, uh, the uh, amount of radiation that your child has is above background and it's this much. So uh, I think that is, it creates a lot of anxiety in the parents. Where was the cesium in his body? Um, the level shows a rise from head to toe, but mostly in the head, mostly on the upper body. Who showed it to you? Uh, the pediatrician. Well, cesium is only made in nuclear reactors. I want to show you this chart because I think it's interesting. It's one of my patients. Uh, he lives uh, in, the three, in the five mile radius. Um, this is the background radiation and uh, this is the amount of radiation that uh, it definitely above the background radiation of, of this patient. This is the head and this is the feet. Uh, they give this chart to the parents and say, Wow, well, yeah, it's hard. Uh, probably you live in a brick home. What are the parents supposed to think? They say, well, it's minimal. It's only uh, 2.03 cesium. Uh, cesium-137 is definitely uh, a substance that is uh, generated in nuclear reactors. Well, Brian had a scan. They had a <coughs> scan downtown where they, uh, they went and laid in this big thing and they checked for uh, radiation elements, I guess. And uh, it was some outfit from California. I don't know who it was. And they went back, and they had mentioned to Stephanie about uh, we must live in a brick house because it showed showed uh, he had some. I don't even know what it was really, but he was a little higher than most people. And they said, "Well, you must live in a brick house. This is the reason." So uh, we were a little concerned after we thought about that for a while. And we we got in contact with the people to get the uh, results of the test, and it took us what six months. No. How long takes to get the test? Well, we wrote, we got the test, and then we took it to our doctor, and he said he could get someone to analyze it for us. And then just this past week, he f we finally got to talk to him, and uh, there was two things they tested for, and one, uh, he, t he had told us one was cesium, which is, I think, when the core melts, it, he knows what comes out, and, and he had <coughs> a higher than uh, normal reading on that. So, you know, that's the only real evidence that that we would think. And plus, you know, everything is coming out in the press now. Where maybe there was a lot more that came out than we know of. You know, the, the instruments went bad and all that. You know. Did the doctor tell you what to do? He said uh, there wasn't, you know, anything that we can really do because it's, it's never happened before. And that uh, the only thing we can do is keep getting physicals for the children and, and just keep an eye on it and see if anything develops. He said just. There's just nothing to compare it to. He, you know, he says it may have an effect, it may not. You know, it's just, just nothing they, they don't know. The baby's only a year old. What'll happen to her 20 years from now <coughs> is when anything that did happen to us will show up 15 to 20 years. She'll just be starting to get well, married and make her own plans for a family. How do you tell her she can't have any kids? Because of Three Mile Allen. What do you feel about nuclear power now? Um, a child's life should never be put second in order to be able to turn a light switch on. <laughs> That's, I agree with that. And I have strong feelings on that, too. <laughs>
Well, just what my wife said. You know, it's just, it's you know it's been eating away at me for long ever since it happened. You know, and, and we discussed, uh, especially this week, we've been discussing a lot more. And it just seemed to come up a little more recently, and and you know it's just I never really brought it out to Steph how bad it did bother me. You know. I think, you know, that you don't know what's really happening to your children. And I don't believe that, you know, that, that nothing's coming out of Three Mile Island, you know. I just don't trust them. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you don't know. Can, can you stop, man? Can you stop? The word is out. I know some of you don't want to hear it. Nobody care It might hit you now It may take 30 years Leukemia and cancer Have already taken their toll Do you want to die young? Do you want to grow old? As my our lives, you know, it's affected us to me to the point that uh, I just don't believe in. I think there there has to be safer methods, and uh, the money we spend on nuclear energy could be spent to develop coal, or especially in Pennsylvania with as much coal as we have. And why why risk something like this happening? You know, we got lucky this time. It, it, got, it cooled off, but if it wouldn't have, like uh, the transcript came out afterwards. That uh, Saturday when it was heating up, they didn't even know what was going to happen. You know, down there, and he, something you don't know that anything about like that. Uh, I just don't trust it. I think, you know, for ev everybody's sake, to, to <coughs> they should go try to get in this, another field for energy. I just don't believe in it at all anymore. You tell yourself really didn't happen, and it's not going to happen to you because we're running away from something that we can't even see. It's just something somebody's telling us is there and is, is getting us. See, you can see a flood. You can see if your house burns down, but you just can't see something that you just can't see it. You know, we left for 11 days. We didn't really know why we were leaving. I could see, we could see pictures on the television of a flood coming at you, but the radiation was there, but we just couldn't see it. And now they said it was so high they couldn't even monitor it. What would you do if the plan was <coughs> I would, this is what we were just, have been discussing, and I, I don't think I would stay here. I don't even know if I'm mm -hmm. gonna stay here while they clean it up. I just don't know if I, you know, my house is a year old, and my family's lived here, you know, 
my mother and my father and everybody all their lives, you know, I just, I would still move. We might, we still might, you know, because what's in there now has to be cleaned out. And they don't even know, and I don't know, and I don't trust them. The accident will go on, will continue, quite literally, for years. It cannot help but continue during the cleanup of the plant. Now, I was at TMI just last Friday. I was part of the first anti-nuclear delegation to set foot on the island and get close-up view of the reactor. We met with Vice President Herbine, and he said that they fully expect to dump two million curies of radiation right into the air and a million gallons, 800 million, 800,000 gallons of radioactive water with cesium-137 right into the Susquehanna River. They do not have a cold shutdown down there. It is not the same type of cold shutdown that they've had in other reactors. My personal opinion from what I can understand is that they essentially have a runaway reactor there. They can't get it stopped. TMI, too, is not in, in a cold shutdown. The radioactivity is leaking out of the plant, both uh, uh, by conscious releases, like the, uh, the 4,000 gallons that they released a few days ago, uh, and just by leaks that they, that they are not uh, particularly in control of. And that, re that release of radioactivity will go on for years. What has happened since the accident, and I call it the radiation fear syndrome, is that now any additional amount of radioactivity that's discharged, the people are very, very concerned about. And that is the problem. I, I, I don't know how to resolve that problem. Releases to the river have been very, very low and uh, each liquid release would be monitored prior to its discharge. When things that are, were, were still kept, kept inside the, the reactor uh, buildings are now planning on being released, now we're going to see the isotopes that didn't get out now coming out. And now we're going to see the strontiums and the cesiums and those kinds of isotopes. The only other uh, uh, likely release is if the containment building contains a uh, fair amount of krypton gas, which is a long half-life of about 10 and a half years. Krypton could be released to the air. The cleanup of the water could be released to the environment within the allowable limits. But no one wants to, no one says the allowable, well, we'll accept the allowable limits anymore. They want zero, and zero is impossible. And someplace between the allowable limit and zero. Oh, they're, they're, unit two is going to be deadly for years. They, they won't be able to go in there for years, if ever. So that I don't know what kind of radioactivity is being released from there. I don't want to live near it, even if it's in perfect operating condition, because I don't like the normal routine. They keep saying, oh, well, that's allowable by law. This is allowable by law. It's, in within, it's within allowable limits. I don't like that. I don't want anything anymore. I think they're just using us as guinea pigs. How long would it take to release the gases inside Three Mile Island, inside the storage room? I would, I would think they would, they would try to do it uh, slow enough so that the amount of each release would be within some acceptable, quote, you know, NRC guidelines. But when you add it all up, they're going to release all of it. You now have to also get rid of the water when you're through, which would be highly radioactive. And this covers the reactor, which is big in itself, 20 or 30 feet. So we have a tremendous amount of radioactive water, which must be then decontaminated and uh, taken away. Put where? Well, the only way that's been suggested is to dump it in the Susquehanna after it's been decontaminated. How much water has accumulated at this point? Well, in the auxiliary building, uh, there are about 300,000 gallons of uh, contaminated water. Uh, in the basement of the containment building itself, about 600,000 gallons. And in the primary coolant system itself, uh, about 100,000 gallons. So that adds up to roughly a million gallons. Is that an increasing amount of water? It, it is increasing at a very slow rate. We estimate that total leakage is less than a half a gallon a minute, which is uh, perhaps 700 gallons a day, which is, of course, small in comparison to a million gallons. But it is continuing, yes. By the time that water is cleaned up, no matter what it contains, uh, if it is discharged to the river, or if it's taken off site, or if it's evaporated, 
uh, the requirements will be that uh, the, the purity of the water will have to be at environmental standards. Then there never was an expectation that the water would be completely clean. It will simply be within the well, regulations. You, you can never clean all of the radioactivity out of the water, just as you can't uh, you know, make anything 100% pure. Uh, but uh, I think as I indicated before, uh, they would be, uh, the water would be cleaned down to our environmental requirements, which would mean that uh, uh, it would be safe for drinking, it would be safe for recreational use, safe for fishing, uh, and uh, it's uh, not within our regulations really at this point in time to require it to go further. What do you think about the way our government has managed nuclear power, nuclear energy? What can I say? <laughs> Gross. <laughs> uh, they lie. Uh, they're lying at Harrisburg. The NRC have lied. When anybody can say, we'll give you a tenth of a millirem per year, and insist on the standard being 1,700 times higher, you can only draw one conclusion. This undoubtedly is the biggest liar I have ever encountered in my entire existence. They don't understand genetics. They don't understand biology. They say it's safe. They say it's safe because they don't understand it. And they are dealing with human lives, not just now, but for the next million years, because that's how long the radioactive waste remains potent. The entire nuclear energy industry rests on a fraud, and that fraud is that there's a safe amount of radiation. That's what they sell to the workers, that's what they sold to the utility companies, and what the utility companies have been selling to the public. Now, inside that reactor, the radiation level is extremely high, and eventually those men are going to have to go in there, and there are going to be every precaution taken before they do enter to make sure that uh, no one does receive more radiation than they're allowed. And I think we have the people down there that are capable of looking at the situation, and when they say it's okay for our people to go in, then I feel that it's safe for them. We do common laboring work, common laboring work. So therefore, in the restoration of this plant and the decontamination of the plant, the labor will be take a great part in, in, in that facility. Now, it would be problematical and be interesting to note uh, how many of our people will, will uh, actually work there. We can't force people to go to work. It's against the Second Amendment. It is highly dangerous. It is lethally dangerous. And we have workers dying every day today from exposures that incurred 25 and 30 years ago in nuclear activities when the government used to tell everyone it was safe. I don't know whether our safety man, our safety inspector, knows enough about nuclear power to know what is safe and what is unsafe. The fact is it wasn't safe, and it can be established now that it was not safe. We've been out and out lied to for, very many, for many years as to uh, you know, some of the inherent dangers and the problems. Uh, and I think Three Mile highlights that. I don't think all of the truth was ever known about uh, the problems that we had in other industrial accidents. There's plenty of evidence around today. St. George, Utah is a classic. We survey our members today. The state of health of our members who worked in the nuclear submarine construction phase uh, for defense armaments and implements in this country. And their rates of cancer are six, seven, eight times and more what it is for all the people that worked in other parts of the shipyard. So no one can uh, say with any reliance whatsoever on fact that it isn't lethally dangerous. It is. The incident is not over. It's still going on. Uh, true, the unit's in a state of cold shutdown, but the unit is still there. Uh, you have the uh, contaminated water problem. You have, uh, I'm sure, contamination inside uh, of the containment vessel and, uh, and things of that nature. So uh, the problem is still not over. Eventually they're going to have to go inside when they're going to find. I don't think there's been such a major problem as this before. So it's going to take a lot of new technology in order to, to remove the spent fuel material in the reactor. Will an evacuation be necessary? 
uh, a very precautionary one, a small one. Uh, it's, it's not over yet. A lot of people think it is. Things have returned to normal, and uh, I, for that I'm, I'm grateful. But uh, uh, it's still in the back of my mind that it's, it's just not over yet. The releases that have already been made are, are small compared to what you can look forward to in the future uh, being released because it's, it's basically the destruction of the core was uh, so extensive that, that there's, no, um, there's no way really to contain the radioactivity. Uh, when they open up the reactor, they have no idea how they're going to get the fuel out. They're going to have to design all kinds of systems to get the fuel out. We still have an emergency. Uh, we, are, we, we feel we're working under emergency conditions all the time, and one has to go very slowly and very carefully uh, to handle these problems. The removal of this material, uh, depending on what sort of shape it is in, will also require the same type of procedure, some sort of a tool to get down there, uh, hook onto the, the fuel elements themselves, or whatever is left of the fuel elements, and uh, they'll all be handled underwater. Uh, one couldn't sand the radiation that, uh, that would ensue if the water didn't separate the people from the fuel itself. Is there any danger from emitters uh, like plutonium into the air from the containment? Uh, we found them in, in very trace amounts in some of the liquid, uh, uh, radioactive liquid measurements that we've made, but uh, that would be expected. We have uh, made measurements in the uh, of, of gross alpha emitters uh, and again, they've been in the very, very low uh, ranges in the water in the auxiliary building. And uh, uh, I expect uh, that there may be some in the water in the reactor building, which we have not measured as yet. Now, the liquid in the water in the auxiliary building, that's the water that they, that they shunted out from the primary coolant that had spilled in the reactor into the auxiliary building? <laughs> Well, that means that the cladding on the fuel rods definitely had melted, and that's the first hard evidence I've had that uh, plutonium got out. That means that probably in the first 48 hours, when they vented the primary coolant, plutonium was released. That means that if plutonium was released, so was curium, americium, californium, neptunium, all the alpha emitters, as well as all the, all the elements. If plutonium got out, that means that the cat's out of the bag. And we still don't know what's going to happen once they open the reactor up and there are no barriers between the fission products in the core and the environment. Once you break the three barriers down, the containment, the reactor, and you've already lost the uh, cladding, uh, those fission products, the fuel is available to the environment, so. I would feel much better if they would just turn it off and forget it, you know, rather than trying to fix it. And uh, I kind of think the people that work there, it's just a job about all of us, and I don't know, I guess it's something they really couldn't worry about, you know, all the time, but still the problem is there, and there wouldn't be any problem if it wasn't on. If we don't get better answers, then we tear it down, get rid of it, because they're going to have to sit, it's like Three Mile Island. It may sit for 250 years before they can even go in the containment building where the accident occurred. And the ratepayers are all going to pay the price of that. It's a long-term experiment, and the people in Harrisburg are guinea pigs like they are in Hiroshima. Now, I've just been to Hiroshima, and the people in Harrisburg want to be a sister city to Hiroshima, and that's very appropriate. People are still dying of cancer now in Hiroshima, 35 years after the bomb was dropped. Harrisburg, it ain't just one city. There are hundreds of its kind. Harrisburg, no, we're not sitting we're pretty. You can't play so dumb. Oh, don't be so blind. Catastrophe near you, yes, near your hometown. And all across this nation, we are sitting, we are sitting on bomb. Shut them down, oh, the children, we must spread the word. Shut them down. Stop these 
corporate criminal while we can still take a breath. A nuclear death. Essentially, the core of the reactor is destroyed. All the radioactivity has been released into water and air. It, and a lot of, most of it, the bulk of it, is still inside the containment building. But there's no way that they're going to clean that all up and safely pack it away. And it's it's going to end up spilling out. It is, it is being released. Uh, night and when it's raining. Now, when it was rained yesterday around noon, then they were letting it out. They do it when it's rainy weather or at night. Uh, they said that there was a cold shutdown. Well, when I go up the cell on a clear day, I can see steam coming out of there. And I'm not even sure if there are releases. Uh, if there are, that uh, they are well within uh, acceptable health limits. Well, I, I'm glad they are, but we ought to see the numbers, and I don't want to see the numbers. So I can myself make the calculations and not be told what the, if it's low level or it's unimportant. We ought to have the numbers in Pico Curies. There have been a, a number of uh, uh, low level releases made to the water uh, because uh, some of the streams discharged to the Susquehanna do contain uh, low amounts of radioactivity. The environmental requirements uh, for the whole three-mile facility, uh, which meet the NRC environmental requirements as well as EPA's uh, drinking water standards, would allow up to 10 curies of radioactivity each quarter to be released, each calendar quarter. Sounds like a small number, doesn't it? Right. 10 curies is nothing more than 10 grams. 10 grams of anything is not much bigger than a little sugar cube of heavy metals. 10 grams of radioactive uh, radium, for instance, 20, 30 grams like that, a quantity like that, were the entire world's supply of radium in the years before the bomb. But from the nuclear plant at Millstone, they discharged the equivalent of five million grams worth of radium into the atmosphere of Rhode Island and Connecticut. Not all of it was as toxic as radium. Radium is one of the more toxic, but the iodine coming out gram for gram for the fetus is much more toxic than the radium. And as far as we know now, 10 million curies went into the air of the people of Harrisburg within a matter of a few days. The NRC environmental uh, requirements based on our regulations uh, uh, contained in Appendix I of 10 CFR Part 50 for the river would uh, basically limit the total uh, dose so uh, an individual could receive three millirem per year from drinking water, fish, and recreational activities and one calculates back then and finds out that uh, with that type of a restriction uh, the plant could release about ten curies per year into the water. Sure, it was safe to drink the water during the time of heavy bomb testing too. Now we know that the people who were drinking the water five or ten years later had a greater risk of developing cancer. Whatever low levels are being released are not harmful to the public. I, I'm an optimist at heart, and I want to believe that, and I do believe it because I have to have faith. Just as the temperature of the river water is protected, so is the ecology. The river is not polluted by Three Mile Island's operations. Water in the nuclear reactor also is in a closed system. Our air is protected too, since there is no combustion of fossil fuels at a nuclear station. Our air and our environment remain unaffected, and the natural beauty continues untouched. You should believe absolutely nothing, nothing whatever that they say. And the outrage of getting ready to dump that water in the Susquehanna they were going to dump it even without any cleanup until the Lancaster residents raised hell. Now they say they'll dump it at the safe NRC standards. The safe NRC standards, translated into plain English, is a license to commit murder. 
The dose they will give people will cost lives. If we wish to require that in installed in an operating plant, uh, we do have to consider uh, the relative cost and the relative gain in safety. Uh, likewise, in our environmental regulations, we do consider the cost benefit of further reductions in the release of uh, radioactive effluents, both gaseous and liquids. And uh, these releases are already down to a very low level, and uh, uh, the cost benefit is taken into account uh, because it costs a great deal more to get them down almost to zero. So when the NRC gives you a safe standard, they're saying how many people they think it's all right to murder in exchange for keeping nuclear power plants open. What levels of exposure would a person have to have in order to show symptoms of radiation sickness, such as a sore throat, nausea, or vomiting, things of that nature? Thousands of times greater than they received at Three Mile Island. You'd have to get into the range of uh, 40,000, uh, 400,000 millirem exposure, uh, 400 rem exposure before you'd really see some, some serious illnesses. Uh, above 100 rem syndrome. Uh, but that, uh, well, we're talking that the average people within 10 miles from the plant got about 8 millirem. That is about uh, 400,000 less than, uh, uh, than what they would have to have received to get sick. That's 400 rems. That's just about the LD50, the lethal dose to kill half the population. That man should also be He's either totally ignorant, and he shouldn't be in the EPA if he's totally ignorant, or he's lying, and if he's lying, he should be put on trial, because that is an obscene statement to make. Well, the, the plant instrumentation in the stack, which would monitor gases, so the radioactive gases going out the plant vent, uh, did indeed go off scale. The problem was the uh, millions of carries of Xenon-133, and that's what set, up, set it off. Noble gases. Uh, these, however, do not stay with the body. They don't uh, con combine chemically with anything, and uh, so they are uh, much less uh, of a concern in the... The Xenon, uh, it's a noble gas. It doesn't interact with anything. It just uh, uh, dissipates in the environment. But now we're down to a point in the, uh, where the xenons are not as important anymore. They're gone. They've decayed away. Xenon and krypton are indeed chemically rare gases. But uh, that doesn't mean they're not harmful. It turns out that xenon-137, for instance, Noble gases, uh, particularly krypton, doesn't combine chemically uh, in biological systems, except that it happens to be 10 times more soluble in fat than water. It does diffuse through the alveolar capillary membrane from the lung into the blood. Krypton-89 will come out the stack, tiny quantities, um, will turn into strontium-90, sit on the ground of the cow, and then the cow is milked the next day. Well, the milk is taken to the, um, be pasteurized to the dairy, and then the next day it's distributed. And the iodine-131 goes in the same way, on the grass and into the food, into the cow's food, and then ends up in the milk that is being fed to the children or the babies or pregnant mother a day or two later. A very efficient mechanism of getting the radiation from near wherever the fallout came to a city 50 miles away. Even 30, 40, 50, 100 miles away, you can transport this radioactivity, and it turns out that the strontium-90, which has a half-life of 30 years, keeps building up in the bone along with the calcium because the body cannot distinguish between strontium and calcium. Oh, um, there have been uh, several million curies of, of xenon. Uh, xenon-137, which is also a noble gas to cases 
uh, cesium-137, which is also as dangerous as strontium-90. We've got krypton. Uh, it's a serious problem in the, that's got to be released. Uh, and the other isotopes, the cesium, the strontium, and uh, the long half-life isotopes. These are the bone seekers and the, and the ones that can get into the milk and food chain and are of concern during the cleanup process, which is four years long. They are going to release all the things. There's no way to hold, it, hold those rare gases like krypton in. There's no filters. One of the isotopes of krypton is a precursor of strontium-90. Decays quite rapidly to strontium-90. None of these elements that are released stay as, as, uh, as the isotope they originally started as. They decay to form other radioactive isotopes. The best we can calculate about 15 curies of iodine over the entire course of the accident. That's an enormous amount. The normal emissions from a plant like only one one thousandth of one carry. We have estimates of the exposure. I think it's in the range of 15 to 40 curies of radioactive iodine that was released over the course of the accident. That's a hell of a lot of dangerous doses. What can I say? There are 10 to the 12, that's how a million is 10 to the 6, so that's a million million. Or say you can cut that by a couple of, a couple of orders of magnitude. It's still, you know, say a thousand million dangerous doses in each curie, and 15 to 40 curies. How many people live in, I mean, that's... <sighs> and then it all gets concentrated in the food, you see, and then, and then the milk, and then gets into the bodies of people. 20 times more sensitive to the effects of radiation than adults. So what's going to happen to the children? I wonder how many thyroid tumors we're going to see in thyroid nodules in people living in Harrisburg. Take a look at Harrisburg. Pretty soon we'll know how bad they got hurt. Now they're going to try to cover up the dirt. Those people got radiated. At the NRC, they're supposed to work for you and me. But they promote atomic industry. We get radiated. When you get radiated, you don't just fall down and die. Well, contamination builds up in your body. And radiation shortens your life. Take a look at where your money goes. They built a worldwide nuclear show. your right foot in, say goodbye to your feet, they poison all the air we breathe, and all the food we eat, look at the Pentagon, what do you see, those boys are planning World War III, they're playing games with humanity, we get radiated. When uh, radioactive material, uh, it, it, it stays there. And uh, over your lifetime, uh, one, after, one after another, these, these atoms uh, a transformation and they emit a little piece of energy. Could be an electron or a beta particle, could be an alpha particle, it could be a gamma ray. But that energy will, uh, gets emitted inside you and it tears up some of the chemicals, bonds that are holding together the, the molecules that the, your cells are made of those cells is, is, uh, can be destroyed. You're saying that uh, once your body has been exposed, there's no way of getting rid of this. That's right. Once, once it's been incorporated into your body, th th it, uh, it stays with you. I don't think you can ever hope to become immune to a process that dismantles the molecules that you're made out of. Uh, there's no, that's not a, you're gonna get immune to. It's just taking, it, it just attacks just the very basic structure of, of the materials that, uh, that you're made of. So it's not a question of getting immune to it. We uh, do take into account the accumulation uh, in the fish as well as the accumulation in our own bodies and uh, uh, figure out the dose in a 50-year time period. And uh, so the, the calculations do indeed take into accumulation 
and uh, integration over a substantial period of time. So if you drink uh, water that contains strontium-90 or you drink milk that contains strontium-90, it, it may be low levels by somebody's definition, but you're accumulating that. Well, the uh, uh, part of our agricultural community is the finished product of milk, pork, poultry, both meat and eggs. A uh, great deal of grains are raised, but uh, they're not... Pennsylvania is not self-sufficient in the production. Actually, myself, I wouldn't even buy any dairy products that even come out of that area now. So it was a, quite a bit of concern among the people that I talked with as to uh, the effects from the radiation that was released to the Three Mile Island. When they set an acceptable limit or a, or a, uh, uh, a safe limit, it's just words. Uh, it's, it's all dangerous and, and, and any amount that gets in, incorporated into your body is then going to uh, continuously uh, radiate you f for, the, for the rest of your life. We already have uh, in our bones and uh, in our bodies plutonium and strontium testing that went on in the 50s and the 60s. The stuff that's made in nuclear power plants is stuff like radioactive iodine, strontium-90, cesium-137, and 200 other radioactive elements. Now, in our diet, it, our diet contains minerals like iodine, iron, potassium, etc., that the body uses to make enzymes, to make the cells work and metabolize. And the body doesn't discriminate between radioactive element. They're just the same to, that, to the body. So if you eat food containing radioactive iodine, the body thinks it's ordinary iodine, so it's absorbed from the gut. And the iodine molecules are taken up and deposited primarily in the thyroid gland in the neck. And if it's a radioactive molecule, it sits in the thyroid gland and it just irradiates cells, a very small volume of cells, over a long period of time. Those cells get a high dose of radiation and the rest of the body gets nothing. Each of us now contains in our bodies enough plutonium that our cells are bombarded by an alpha particle emitted inside us once every 10 seconds. An ordinary glass of milk now contains plutonium that it emits a burst of radiation once every second. The best estimates are that for every year's fuel for a nuclear plant, they've spilled enough of their garbage to account for 450 lung cancer deaths for each year of operation of one nuclear plant. Now, those 450 deaths don't occur that year. They'll be spread out over a long time. But a death warrant today and the death warrant for your child is the same thing. It's made in nuclear power plants. It's a man-made element. If you get a picogram of plutonium, which is 10 to the minus 12 grams, it's the most minute amount that you can imagine. You can't see it, it's just, you almost can't measure it. The dose that that amount gives to the surrounding cells, Dr. John, 132,000 rems. And I said if you get a, a dose of 500 rems to the whole body, that's a lethal dose. 132,000 rems from a picogram of plutonium. It's almost sort of like talking about infinity, like space going on forever. Radiation, it's bloody high level radiation and that's why these materials that are made in nuclear reactors are so carcinogenic. Let me tell you the facts about plutonium. <clears throat> First of all, it is far worse if you breathe it than if you eat it because the amount it takes from my own and other researches to produce lung cancer if you uh, breathe it is very, very minute. And if I die of a plutonium-induced cancer and the plutonium's still in my body, the smoke goes out of the chimney with the plutonium con conceivably to be breathed into somebody else's lung. And that cycle can go on for the next half a million years. The work of the last year has shown that just the chlorine of drinking water is enough to oxidize the plutonium to a form 
that if you eat it, it's absorbed a thousand to ten thousand times as well as all those earlier calculations are based. You better not have any of that plutonium mixed with water that you're from the chlorinated supplies because it'll be well absorbed and cause quite a bit of trouble. Plutonium just needs to be kept out of the environment in toto, either from breathing or eating. When I first read about plutonium as a physician, I realized that it must never, ever, Denver's contaminated with plutonium from Rocky Flats. Everyone's got a little bit of plutonium in their body from fallout. It already is leaking because we're fallible. What happens to fuel rods that are used up in, under normal operation is that get taken out of the reactor every uh, once a year, about a third of the core is removed, and it's stored right next to the reactor in a kind of swimming pool that has a circulating water supply because those fuel rods are still generating heat. At present, the fuel assemblies are stored in racks under about 30 feet of water. And um, these uh, are stored on 21-inch centers. So there is a relatively a lot of area for removal of heat. Heat is still being generated from these fuel assemblies. And some of them, of course, are leaking radioactivity. But what they have been doing is re-rack by going to a ten and a quarter inch centers for these eight inch uh, units and they'll have to then be much more careful with the because the heat will now become a problem and especially if you had a loss of the water that is surrounding them. Now the problem really comes when you um, realize that if there is an accident at the plant you may lose power. Power for cooling the um, spent fuel assemblies and for the uh, air distribution over the spent fuel assemblies. Everybody may run away from the accident and forget about the spent fuel assemblies. And then it would spread to the storage area where you have this tremendous amount of species sitting there. Then you would have a, an additional meltdown uh, from the hot spent fuel that has to be cooled artificially for years after it is pulled out of the reactor. And since there is so much more of the spent fuel than the actual fuel that's in the reactor, the total disaster could be far greater than spent fuel stored in local nuclear reactors near our big cities. We've got some 25,000 members of the IAM who are directly involved in the manufacture, the processing, and the handling of radioactive materials. Another 50,000 or so of our members are indirectly exposed to radioactivity in the airports, truck depots, uh, rail, uh, wherever uh, p workers are likely to confront radioactive substances and materials as they are loaded, unloaded, stored, or transported all across the face of the industrial complex of America, the transportation complex of America. You don't know why they, they want to put you in this situation, you know, they want to put the people in this situation. Oh. Why they continue to use it is beyond me, I don't know. Why can't they use their, all their brains for the sun? I guess some people found it incredible that Metropolitan Edison would be willing to destroy the entire central Pennsylvania area in order to maintain their profits and the idea that nuclear power is safe. The sun, that's a holdup right there. That's the whole thing. It's money. All of this nuclear power technology was developed at public expense and given free to these corporations who are now making money with it. But, um, you know, there's that, well, the government said, it's okay, it's okay, you know. It's a USDA approved <laughs> sort of label on radiation. The real criminals of our era are those that promote nuclear energy and outside. And they're doing it by subverting the Constitution of the United States. It's just clear. If the nuclear industry had in any way to stand behind its product, as every other industry has to in this country, and as every individual has to, the nuclear industry would close tomorrow morning because they're perfectly happy to risk your life, but not their dollars.
big business, corporate business, can't control the sun. They can't say, this is our sun, you pay us to use solar energy. You can develop your own solar panels and use your own solar energy and be totally independent of any corporation. And they won't make a profit off of you if they can't or your energy that you use. The private investors who put up allegedly risk capital didn't risk anything. It's already in the electric bills. And as, as long as it sits there idle, it's going to be paid for by rate payers. And I don't think we ought to be afflicted with that. If it's risk capital in the great American scheme of things, then let the risk takers uh, absorb the loss. But that isn't the way it is. So it's, it's lethally dangerous, it's economically dangerous, and it has the potential to be suicide. There's an awful lot of government subsidy in the construction of the plant. There's money in making the fuel. There's money in selling all the byproducts and everything connected with it. It's one of the largest potential uh, industries and they projected enormous increases in the growth rate of electricity and things like that. So obviously we're dealing with a situation which had enormous isn't safe and I don't care you know what kind of bull they want to give us about Arabs stealing our money and I don't believe that nonsense either you know uh, what's going on here is general public utilities is stealing our money uh, and stealing our lives and the high rate of leukemia come that are uh, that uh, working around with low, low radiation the things that we're finding out in, in working in the shipyards with the subs and the atomic energy those have to be more than just a coincidence those should not be buried any longer. Also, we know about the history of fatal accidents. They say no one's ever died in the history of nuclear power. I have the autopsy reports in my office of many people who have died in nuclear power. For example, January 3rd, 1961, an experimental reactor blew apart. It was the SL-1 reactor. There were three people working on that reactor, McKinley, Legg, and Burns. Burns was sitting on top of control rod number nine. Control rod number nine came out 20 inches by accident. There was a power excursion, a steam explosion. The reactor was blown nine feet into the air. The control rod number nine was shot up Burns' groin, came out his shoulder, and he died instantly. All three people were killed. Burns' face radiated at 1,000 rads an hour. That's twice lethal dose if you were to stand in front of his face for an hour. They could not bury his body. They had to sever the head, sever the arms, and bury the heads in the arm with radioactive waste products. Buried in Arlington, Virginia, in six inches of concrete, which still leaks to this very day. And these are scores of nuclear accidents. 1958, Cecil Kelly got blown apart in a nuclear plutonium dump. 1964, Robert Peabody, got hit with 50,000 rads of radiation to his body, he disintegrated into a piece of charred carbon. Nuclear Processing Center in Rhode Island, 1964. One nuclear plant today costs roughly a billion dollars. The plans of the nuclear industry and all the boys who graduated from Admiral Rickover's Navy, all the market of a thousand nuclear reactors by the end of this year. Now, wouldn't you lie a little bit or deceive yourself a little bit for a thousand billion dollars worth of business? It's, it's big, it's big industry, a lot of dollars handled in the nuclear business in the last 10 years. And there'll be a industry in the next 10 years. It involves a lot of different operations of the nuclear, from the mining of uranium and on through to the producing of nuclear bombs, which they use for with the byproduct of the nuclear nuclear power plant. Well, a nuclear reactor. That's a dangerous thing. But the people in control don't seem to care. We're built on shaky ground. Top. They don't want to stop. They're getting rich from atomic energy. Blow us all sky high. And greed is the reason why. They don't give a damn about the life of you and me. Well, they don't rob any banks. They don't stick up your liquor.
liquor store. But even Charlie Manson had more. They hide the truth with lies. They're above what's wrong and right. And they're coming for your money and your life. A little spill up on Three Mile Hill. It could have blown the whole state away. Now the boys who own the plant, they're wondering why they can't send the bill for the damage. They don't rob any banks. They won't stick up your liquor store. Is there a connection between the peaceful atom, nuclear power, and the arms race? It's the same. Nuclear reactors were first designed to make plutonium during the Manhattan Project to make atomic bombs. And they're still being used now to make plutonium to make bombs because this country makes three to ten new... So there are the military reactors here. Now, during the early, late 50s and early 60s, they decided not to use enriched uranium to make bombs anymore, and enriched uranium was, was used to make the Hiroshima bomb, which was called Little Boy. Because they were going to only use plutonium to make their bombs from reactors and not enriched facilities built at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and they had to use them, right? The theory is, among a lot of people now, that the enrichment facilities, they thought, what can we do with this? Yeah, we'll use enriched uranium to put in reactors and use the heat from reactors to make electricity. And so the civilian nuclear industry is a direct offshoot from the military industry from an obsolete process that they didn't want to use for their bomb nuclear industry. I'm talking about our regular plants which produce up to 100 pounds of plutonium every year. And that plutonium goes into the nice bombs which then are stored so they can be dropped on people. So it seems if you it from the plant uh, releasing radiation, sooner or later, the plutonium is going to be used in even nastier ways. If we want to have these reactors in order to produce plutonium to make warheads, then why don't we be honest with them? You know, I think that's personally one of the reasons we run this. We take the, most of the waste from the foreign countries that have reactors, too, because we like to have that plutonium here. We like to have control over that. The commercial nuclear reactor industry is a support system for the nuclear arms industry. It produces profits, the nuclear arms buildup, and it produces waste products from which plutonium, the crucial ingredient in atom bombs, can be extracted. Nuclear power is the route to nuclear bombs. Because the people that own the resources of the country today and the people who have the most clout in the marketplace today are the people uh, who are running the show politically, pure and simple. Oil has the most money. Uh, oil owns uranium, which makes us at the mercy of the oil companies, even if we go nuclear. And uh, the minute, in my judgment, the minute the last drop of profit is milked out of the fossil fuel resource, and we then turn to uranium, if that should be the case. Uh, we'll be paying uh, blackmail prices for uranium as well because they also own it. And they'll control uh, the rate at which it gets onto the market. And beyond that, another one of the things that that the known reserves of fuel for it will not even fuel all of the existing reactors for their 40-year economic lifetime, that new sources would have to be found. Uh, and that simply suggests to me that we'll get down that road a ways and then will be forced to get into the breeder reactor fuel for the others and because the natural resources will have been exhausted and exhausted at a cartelized price and there can never be any such thing as cheap nuclear energy for that reason. Because plutonium is made in nuclear thousand megawatt reactor 
makes or manufactures 500 pounds of plutonium every year. And that's good for the nuclear industry because within 20 or 30 years, the world is going to run out of uranium-235, which presently fuels present-day light water reactors. And so the present-day nuclear energy is a very transitory form of electricity production, but they plan to form of energy production from nuclear energy, which is the breeder reactor. And the breeder reactor takes the plutonium that's been formed in present-day light water reactors, and which I can get into that in a minute, and makes a reactor which is formed primarily of plutonium, a plutonium core which is naturally fissionable, like uranium-235, and it's surrounded by a blanket of uranium-238, which is not fissionable. Fission products like strontium-90, cesium, iodine, etc. It makes heat, boils water, turns into electricity, or generates electricity. But the neutrons being given off by the fission plutonium are captured by the blanket of uranium atoms, and that turns into plutonium. So you end up eventually with a net increase in plutonium, so you keep breeding it forever. If we do have a supply shortage, and I don't think we ever did, but assuming for a moment we did, Opinion, to ration the available supply fairly and equally among all the users based upon need and give us a fair shot at it, our share. And until they do, we're not being represented properly. And we have a price rationing system which really redounds to the benefit of who? Source, the oil companies. And they aided and abet the Arabs with each new price increase because every time they get one, they're enriched by it. So we know we can't expect them to walk into the room. And they sit there when the Arabs meet. When OPEC meets, representatives of our company sit in the room with them. Activities, because every time an Arab bids up the price another notch, they are the windfall beneficiaries of it. And I think the, Amer the American people better begin understanding that and rush control of this government back in their hands. Shut out the vested interest. And the other thing about plutonium is that it only takes 10 pounds to make an atomic bomb. Now, if we get into the breeder reactor program, which the nuclear industry are hot for doing, it's estimated by the National Council of Churches that by the year 2020, there'll be 30,000 tons of plutonium in this country. Tons. There are now several in the world. Each year, they produce at least 70,000 pounds of plutonium in the waste. This waste sits at the reactor sites with nowhere to go. McNamara worked out in, 19, in the 1950s, if this country had 400 bombs, they could blow up half the Russian population and destroy And that would act as a deterrent. Do you know how many bombs America has now? Over 30,000. And three to 10 new hydrogen bombs are built every day in this country. And we pay for it. We, we can't trust them. We can't trust them not to drop bombs any more than we can't trust them not to blow up their power plants or, or spill radiation into the atmosphere or the rivers. Um, it's, it's all of a concern for what people really need. Nuclear produces no jobs, permanent jobs, as it is. Construction jobs, sure, but once it's built, there are no more jobs. And I think we have to worry about work and its long-term implications, not the short-term or the near-term or the construction term. And uh, if we got off of nuclear, a greater number of jobs than there would be if we stay on it. So uh, it seems to me it's a political decision and not an economic decision. And if we make the political decision to get off of it, that uh, we will generate actually more jobs, short run and long run, and absolutely in the long run. Any other kind of jobs? We do need other sources besides coal and oil, but they have to be developed in the public interest. They can't be developed just to make a profit for somebody. And it's the same thing with the war industry, um, more so with the war industry. We don't need bombs. We don't need MX and Minuteman. Because somebody's making money off of it. Every day, for years and years, more and more weapons are made for profit. You know, they're not made. The MX is frightened of the Russians. The MX is made for profit. The United States has enough weapons now to kill every person on Earth 12 times over, to kill every Russian person 40 times. 
Roslyn Carter launched a Trident submarine one uh, recently. John Glenn announced with exhilaration, now we have retaliation of the Russians. If anyone had said that 30 years ago, they would be plonked straight into a lunatic asylum and the doors slammed on them. In that one Trident submarine, in fact, there are enough weapons to blow up every major city in the Northern Hemisphere, and America is building about 27 Trident submarines. Of the Russians, because they can overkill the Russians 40 times. They're building them for profit. Next year, it's thought that 52 cents out of every federal tax dollar paid will go into the military industrial complex. There is an intimate tie in between the production of plutonium and every nuclear reactor used by a small country like another Idi Amin or a terrorist group. And as a result, I do not see how mankind could ever have peaceful nuclear energy without living in constant fear of nuclear terrorism and nuclear war. For Christ's sake, educate yourselves. Learn what's happening to your world. Learn Learn how over half the scientists in this country are employed by the military industrial complex. Nobody puts it all together except the top management. And uh, they don't put it out to the public. They may know, but they don't uh, level with the public. The, the arms race are the corporations. That's all obscured by the oil companies from the American people. And I think it's high time they sit up and take notice. They're being taken to the cleaners by a special interest. Big oil. The moral, ethical issue is joined right here. Do we want, for the sake of some to risk the very future of the next generation? You are it. You're the next generation. You are, you know, and the people after you. You'll find behind it is, uh, is a real political insanity and a commitment towards death and destruction that pervades the whole society. And it could be us. That's what really makes me mad, was the fact that what could go wrong. I don't see why people aren't here really going out there and forming human chains across the road, you know, to just close it down completely, to just turn it into a $500 million monument. And it's going to take a vast popular movement, which is going to take as much effort as any popular movement in this country ever had. For the 40-hour work week. We're going to have to demand it. We're going to have to fight for it. And it's not something that's just going to be won. I tell them to go to hell, pure and simple. Because that's where we'll, we'll fight it out finally, bottom line, someplace. Maybe on the streets, maybe in the workplace, who knows? But we'll fight it out. I think the government is not performing its proper functions. And the future of the race, the human race. Mm. There are too many biological factors involved that we know very little about. It makes us guinea pigs, definitely. Uh, it is, it's part of an experiment. And uh, people are not, asked, uh, are not asked for their consent. Experimentation bef uh, without informed consent. What happened here should never, ever happen to anyone again under any circumstances, and it will because of the nothing they can do to make these things safe safe enough for us harrisburg was not the first partial meltdown it's the seventh partial meltdown or explosion in the history of nuclear power meltdown is planned for and the very word accident and there'll be a hundred thousand shipments of plutonium along the highways every year in this country it's worth more than heroin on the black market the Teamsters drive the trucks in this country, and we all know the Mafia have a strong influence on the Teamsters. And uh, it's not going to be long before people are making their own atomic bombs and plutonium easily. The military already use plutonium to make their atomic bombs all the time. So we're hooked into a, just a totally vicious circle of civilian uh, terrorist bombs stemming from this non-nuclear nations making atomic bombs from their nuclear Taiwan, South Korea, Pakistan, South Africa, probably Israel's doing it, uh, Egypt's about to do it, and then back to the military industry in this country, which props up the, 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 the economy of the United States is virtually built on the military industrial complex, and they make plutonium. And yet this country says to Pakistan, you're not to 
ones who are allowed to make them and know how to handle them. So does Russia say that. And you know, that doesn't hold any water with You are telling us we can't make atomic bombs and you make three to ten hydrogen and so the, the world is It's thought that by most many eminent scientists now we have before we blow ourselves up in a global holocaust. We are the curators of life on earth. We hold it in the palm of our hand. And it is our ultimate responsibility as spiritual and moral feeling human beings to save this Planet. Space Station soldiers on atomic testing land. They let them get cooked. Like and when them GIs started to die. What peaceful use do they have for atomic waste? None! It's a tool of a nuclear war. That's what they want it for. Don't be fooled by the liars in the Pentagon. It's a war machine. The killers fight around. Playing with a loaded gun There's an atomic time bomb Inside of everyone And they poisoned us for so long They tell you that it's not wrong There's a radiation death Waiting for everyone It's a war
And now they're dying of cancer from mining uranium. Black labor is out the south land. But they never knew the dangers of an atomic waste plant. We are the good thing. Or in the plants across the plains. Workers are disposable if it fits their plan. They test it in our backyards, expose us all to radiation. In the name of science, in the defense of this great nation, we are the guinea pigs. Every man, woman, and child. We 